I'd like to welcome you to sociology class. And in our first mini lecture, we are going to be looking at chapter one, an invitation to sociology. And in this mini lecture, we're going to look at how sociology was founded and the different aspects of sociology and what we're going to be studying within this course. So let's go ahead and take a look at the founding of sociology. Now there are many different events that actually come to lead to sociology and how it starts. We need to go back to mid 1800s around to 1920. The world was changing. Things were changing. Society was changing rapidly. We start to see imperialism taking place over Europe, nationalism taking place within countries. Lots of immigrants are coming to the United States and to other countries in the world. We see our world changing and we want to know one, why it was changing, and two, what was with all this change? We knew that culture also played a distinct factor in this, especially with immigrants coming to the United States. And we want to actually understand the whole meaning of why our society was changing. Three subjects, psychology, economics, and political science, helped to found sociology. Psychology, understanding your mind, understanding why we do what we do. Economics, studying how jobs, how um, the system of commerce affects society. And then we also have political science, studying of government. All these factors help to found sociology. But not only those three subjects, also anthropology, the study of the past, demography, the different people that are in the society, and gerontology, looking at the older people in society, speaking with them, and able to understand how society has changed. All those things help to found sociology. Augusta Comte is the founder of sociology. He's the one who coins the term sociology to study group life, to study how our society functions, and why we do what we do. He says that you must have a scientific approach to study the world and to be able to understand that change. After all, a world war occurred in night, around 1914. And when that world war occurred, we want to understand how that would impact our society. Harriet Marteau, it's not Harriet Martineau, it's Harriet Marteau. Harriet Marteau studies interaction with the United States and England. She advocates for change in society and understanding that change. But in addition, she writes the first sociology textbook to be able to understand the research methods on why a society is changing and what changes occur. Herbert Spencer is a sociologist who views our society as evolutionary and that our society is always changing in the world, no matter what, and we cannot stop the change from occurring that we must always be willing to embrace it, but at the same time, we must study it and be able to look at it to understand. Karl Marx, you probably have heard of him mostly with his writings on communism, but Karl Marx explains history in terms of conflict between those who control and those who do not. There is going to be conflict between the government and the people, and some of these conflicts deal with economic relationships. People are oppressed in certain places, and this leads to his writing on communism. And ironically, Karl Marx did not live in a communist country. He was from England. Emil Durkheim studies social factors in society and the lowest part of society. His main studies deal with suicide and why people are more likely to commit suicide in a society. He wants to understand the levels of social interaction and how those levels break down. He also does a little bit of studying with religion, but we're going to leave that mainly up to this guy here, Max Weber. Max Weber looks at religion and society. Max Weber studies the Protestant ethic, saying that Protestants have a stronger work ethic and a harder work ethic than non-Protestants. I find it interesting that Max Weber here looks a lot like King George V in this picture. But Max Weber studies religion in its aspect on society and how it gives meaning to people for their lives. Now, in, in 1893, the first sociology school was established. 
This is not long after the actual founding of sociology, when Augusta Comte coined the phrase sociology. And we look at sociology, basically says society and the studying of society. People realized how important it was and they established a school so people would look at it. And then in 1905, a mere 12 years after the first schools established, we see the largest organization and association for sociology, the American Sociological Association being founded. This is pretty neat because this showed how important this aspect was and why people need to study. Charles Horton Cooley is the sociologist who, who pioneers work on small groups in society. He looks at small groups, and small groups can be ranged from a handful of people to a couple thousand. It just depends. If you look at a, if you look at a school of about 2,000 people, a small group in that school would be a small class, probably about 14 to 30. That would be a small group. You wouldn't look at the school as being a small group, but yet in the broader scheme of society, it actually is. Jane Addams is another sociological advocate who, won't, who studies activism. If she is a major part of United States history because she founded a place called Hull House. Hull House was in Chicago, and it was a place for immigrants to live but yet get help to be able to do a job. Jane Addams saw the immigrants were coming and did not necessarily know what to do and how to do a certain trade and a skill. And she said immigrants need to be a integral part of society and give back to the society that is giving them a place. So she found a whole house as a way to help immigrants to give them a place to live, to get on their feet, get them a skill to be able to learn, so therefore they could go out into society and be a meaningful production to society. Robert Merton studies deviant behavior and crime, and when we get to our mini lecture on chapter 7, we're going to study more about deviant behavior. But what this was, was to understand why people go against the norm and the normalcy of society and do things that pretty much would be seen in society as rebellious. Robert Merton studies that. Now, as in any subject, you're going to have the study of the major aspects and the study of the minor aspects. If we look at economics, we have macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomics looks at large-scale civilization, large-scale phenomena, countries as a whole, like, for example, the United States, Brazil, Australia. That's what macrosociology looks at. Microsociology studies small groups. And that can be a handful of people. What would be normally a laboratory experiment? Could be a handful to a couple hundred people. That's what microsociology looks at. If you were to take the Aztecs, the Aztecs themselves and the Aztecs and the Mayans would have been in microsociology. But yet you have a small village that would be, I mean, yes, that would be microsociology, would be the small village, while macro is the entire civilization like the Aztecs and the Mayans. The main function and the functionalist perspective of sociology is to understand how society maintains its stability, how society functions as a whole, and society must work together. Each part of society must work to be able to make the society work as a whole. If the society does not work together or an aspect of society falls, you will not necessarily have the society to pass on to the next generation. Taking a look at this diagram, this explains the functionalist perspective a little more, where if one of these is impacted, health, education, family, government, economy, and religion, if one of these is impacted, all are impacted. And we can take the 2020 coronavirus pandemic to be able to explain this a little more. Coronavirus is a health issue in the purple there. It affected all five of the others. When the coronavirus occurred, we saw that schools around the world, education, were closed. We saw family units disabled. You didn't have certain income coming in to families. You also had people catching this virus, and families were not able to function as a whole because you could not have the entire family unit together. Governments had to make decisions, which was in the best interest of the citizens of their country. The economies were affected when businesses shut down. And religion was affected because of houses of worship were shut down at the same time, too. 
When one of these was impacted, such as health, the entire thing was impacted. The manifest function is to look at these consequences of society. Society is always going to have consequences no matter what. There are unintended functions that occur. Things that we have dysfunction in our society, where we have disruptions in what goes on, the decreased stability that occurs. What this is, this is our society. We are going to have conflict no matter what. We're not all going to get along. It would be nice to think that, but it doesn't necessarily happen. That's what leads to conflict perspective. Understanding that behavior of why people don't get along. Why there is conflict. Now, conflict is not necessarily always violent. It can be over economics. It can be over values. It does not matter. But there is going to be conflict in society. The Marxist view of this was that conflict happens in everyday life. You're going to have conflict. If change, social change, the meaning of control between those who control and those who do not, is going to cause conflict. You've got these things that occur in society, which causes a rift. The racial view is another aspect of that, where we see that from the eyes of those who are not necessarily the ones who make the decisions. This would be what's known as the minority. This can be in Congress uh, with the different parties that are in the United States government. And it's in our society between those who are minority who are not make up a majority of the population. And you can see these things occur. Right? This mainly you looked at um, conflict, the racial view taking place. And we look mainly in our history at the 1960s with the civil rights movement. Okay? These things influence decision making. And understanding our society as a whole, we must understand and see it from the eyes of all. And this concludes our mini lecture today on the introduction to sociology. Thank you.